2022 was a breakout year for AI. In fact, many have even claimed that ChatGPT is the fastest growing app of all time. So with so much opportunity on the table, AI is the topic of conversation in every boardroom as CEOs figure out how to best integrate this new superpower. But they're also asking really important questions around data privacy, competition, cost, accuracy, and also doing this all really quickly. Because just like your customers really don't care if your product is built with Angular or React or runs on AWS or Heroku, there will be a whole host of ways that companies differentiate as they look to cleverly embed AI. And here is how Hex is thinking about that. Hex is a platform for collaborative data science and analytics. Our users are people doing data work. As a reminder, the content here is for informational purposes only. It should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security, and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. For more details, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. Where is the competitive advantage? Where is the moat? Is it in the UI? It feels like that can be replicated very easily. Is it in the cleaning of the data, the linking of the data? Is it something else? Like, how are you thinking about the fact that basically you can kind of depend on all your competitors to replicate what you do if it's working? Yeah, we've, we've already seen that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, down, to, down to some UI elements that look very familiar. Um, mm hmm uh, yeah, the models themselves are commodities, and they're, they're, that's going to accelerate even in the next couple of years. We're going to see a ton of different types of models emerge. We're going to see the costs plunge even further down. I think the ability to plug these in will become as ubiquitous as like using cloud services. It's just like mm -hmm. everyone does it. I, I think there's a few places where potential moats emerge. One is um, we do have a pretty great data advantage. You know, already having hundreds of customers, thousands of users writing millions of lines worth of SQL and Python, we can use that sort of rich information. Um, mm -hmm. We're not mm -hmm. using it to train models, I should be very clear. Like, that's one thing we've been very upfront with our customers about. Like, we're not training models where they would expect to ever have, like, some code they've written be a completion for someone else, which is a problem in other places. But it's more like using that actually to personalize for that person and their team. Like, you know, again, like, which schemas you're using, which, what has their code style been like in the past? It's really how do you put these pieces together and how do you build a really great user experience both from you know the pixels on the screen to thinking about performance behind the scenes to things like docs like that all sort of combines to being a really superior product experience i do think that long term generative ai large language models they will change a lot of like fundamental assumptions mm -hmm. um, and i think that there will be an advantage to the companies that can be the first ones to figure out um, what those things are. Data can be highly creative, highly fun. Um, but as you are looking to integrate this technology, what does that look like? Under the hood, we are doing a ton in terms of constructing the right prompts and parsing responses back from the, the model APIs we're using. And so we have thousands of people already writing SQL and writing Python and doing data work in Hex every day. So we have a ton of information we've got. We're connected to their database schemas. So we see the structure of their data. We see past queries and past code they've written. So we know which tables and columns are most frequently referenced. Right. We have information about the project they're building. So we know like, oh, this project is already referencing this part of the schema and that's probably the relevant data for this. You could even look at things like, this is the typical way this organization is formatting their charts and infer how they might want their visualizations to look. And so there's a ton of context we get because we're incorporating this in an existing set of workflows that can help us create the right context and, and, and create the right prompt to pass to the model. Any learnings in terms of what is increasing completion rates? What is getting people to actually interface with this new, in some ways, superpower within the app? One of the things that we've observed sort of more on the back end in terms of increasing completion rates is when you're building prompts, I think we've been we were tempted early on to try to shove as much context as we could in. You kind of figure like the more I can tell this model, the better. Yeah. And you realize you can pretty easily confuse a model right. in terms of the <laughs> amount of context you're passing. And so we've been really thoughtful on building the right context, understanding how you're iterating on how different models are going to respond to different types of prompts and different amounts of context, how you're potentially even chaining together different types of models or different modalities of models together in one sequence in UX, and then how you're giving that feedback to the user. Yeah, I mean, I think one interesting facet of all this is that 
there's kind of this realization of the value of data. And I think we're going to see a lot more companies retain their data for longer, collect more data from their products or from their users. And so there's this, again, this privacy security posture of like, okay, we want to have this data. We're probably going to keep it for longer. How do we keep it safe? But then there's also a cost element, right? It's not necessarily free to retain data. It's also not free to run these models. Um, and so how do you it's also kind not, of- It's also not zero risk. A lot of companies intentionally delete their data. Like we'll have retention policies on email right. or Slack. But by exactly. doing that, you're- eliminating knowledge and that knowledge could be useful sort of like in the first instance just like i want to go back and search that's the thing i think a lot of big companies deal with as they start to like have record retention things but there's also like second order value to that in terms of could that inform a model or a um you know potential different applications for how you could learn from what your organization has done historically so I don't know where we're going to wind up on that. I do think you're right that a lot of companies are realizing the value of their data and their IP and thinking about that in a deeper way. I think there's all sorts of really exciting opportunities on how you could use data that customers are trusting you with, making sure you're continuing to earn that trust, you know, as you are applying these generative techniques with it is paramount and something where, you know, we expect to be uh, a central theme as long as we run the company. If you like this segment, you're going to love our next video where we chat with Sourcegraph, a company that has spent the last decade mastering search, who thinks they're uniquely positioned for this AI wave. And if you like this topic, we go a lot deeper on the A16Z podcast, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.